Invaluable intelligence, short and sweet. eMarketer's Chart of the Day newsletter delivers one insightful chart each day to help you better understand trends across marketing, media, advertising, commerce, technology, finance, and more. Each edition also includes suggestions on how you can use these charts in presentations and pitch decks. Visit insiderintelligence.com slash chart of the day and sign up today. No one is going to Spotify to purchase, you know, individual things like it's iTunes back in the day. So the fact that now it like really is integrated into the full, you know, subscription, I think will make a big difference for Spotify. Hey gang, it's Tuesday, November 7th. I can't even make it sound like it's not in the morning. It's early, okay? Bear with me. Daniel and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily and eMarketer podcast. I'm Marcus, today I'm joined by one of our analysts on the marketing and advertising briefing based in New York. It's Daniel Konstantinovich. Hello, thanks for having me. Hey fella, of course, thanks for being here. Today's fact, who invented Velcro? Well, oh, I have you know no this? idea. Oh, okay. I don't know wow. <laughs> I did kind of take a bank. long pause. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no idea. What is it? Swiss engineer George de Mestral got the idea for Velcro from cockle burrs. So they're those seeds with the tiny hooks on them. Oh, They've yeah. Got like hundreds of tiny, tiny hooks, really tiny seeds. And uh, they caught in his clothes and his dog's fur during a walk in the woods in 1948. I feel like everything that was invented was just an accident. Yeah, you know, just discovered sat in nature. Down and thought about it. Yeah, which I wish Velcro was socially acceptable as an adult. You can't strap on a pair of Velcro, you know. Like, you know, I think we're moving. Date. I think we're moving there because oh, you know oh. el- the elastic like waistband has become accepted and come into fashion That's right like in the last couple of years. Like right now, I'm wearing these wool pants that look very like nice and classy, but they're like sweatpants. There's like an elastic band. But that's not even the best time of clothes. Tell, tell the listeners what you're rocking up top. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we talked about this before. I'm wearing a windbreaker I stole from my dad that is reversible. One reversible. Side, one side is all so green. The other side good. is a uh, red with a white sleeve and a blue sleeve. Amazing. Five seconds later, brand new outfit. Brand new outfit. That's right. Uh, Next week, it will have to do a video podcast. <laughs> Just for this. Yeah, for um, this. <laughs> anyway, today's real topic. How Spotify's first price hike affected the music streaming giant. In today's episode, first in the lead, we'll cover Spotify. Then for another news, we'll discuss how badly AI can hurt your company's customer service and Google's call to ban personalized ads for miners. We start with Spotify. And we're going to talk about their price hike uh, a little bit later in the lead. But let's start with audiobooks. Because earlier this year, Spotify said it would be giving premium subscribers, folks who pay, 15 free, one five free hours of audiobook listening per month across 150,000 titles. It just made that possible for Brits and Australians, and Americans will get that perk next year. Spotify launched audiobooks a year ago. Since then, it struck deals with the five biggest publishers in the US, as well as hundreds of others. Uh, But Danny, can audiobooks move the needle for Spotify? You know, I don't know if it's going to be this like killer service that is going to suddenly make Spotify revenues jump a million percent, but I think it will lead to some significant growth for the premium tier because Mm. the audiobook access is for premium subscribers. Right. You get about 15 hours of, you know, free listening per month. And I think it'll make Spotify a stickier service, which it's already succeeded really well in doing. You know, if, if you're a listener to any kind of audio, there's really no reason to leave the Spotify app once you're in there because it's so personalized. There's such a, a you know breadth of audio content and audiobooks really like makes it the audio super app. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Good for engagement. Really good for engagement. Yeah. And 15 hours of, of free listening. And the New York Times article I was reading by 
Alexandra Alter and, and Trip Mickle were noting that the average audiobook lasts seven to ten hours. And that's according to Spotify, and so subscribers can listen to about a, a book and a half per month. Mm-hmm. Some titles run longer than that, but the average American reads. It doesn't sound like a lot, actually. Oh, that's that's going to they're going to burn through that quite quickly. The average American <laughs> reads one book a month, according to Pew. So that's actually spot on in terms of how much most people are going to consume. And so if you can add, you know, all those extra hours to Spotify's listenership, it's fantastic for engagement and. All also, on top of that, Spotify has an audience that could be ready to be served books. That New York Times article pointing out Spotify has the tools to recommend relevant audiobooks to podcast listeners who are interested in particular subjects and to promote audio titles to Spotify users who have listened to a podcast featuring a particular author. Yeah, that's a really great point. It really integrates well with the other services that are offered by Spotify. Spotify is so good at recommending, you know, new content to listen to, new podcasts. Well, mostly new music. It's best Mm -hmm. at new music, but podcasts, it's still as good at suggesting things there. And, you know, it's got like suggestions down in a way that the video streaming services have almost kind of given up on doing. And I think, you know, to your point about the one book a month, I would imagine that the way that someone consumes an audiobook is different from the way they're reading an actual book. You know, yeah. if you think about the way that we listen to podcasts like in transit or while doing the dishes or mm-hmm. while getting groceries, you know, I would imagine that audiobooks are consumed in a similar way. So, yeah. you know, people might hit that limit and then be willing to pay extra for more access. Yeah. Spotify has had audiobooks for about a year now, but they were not able to because of various, you know, legal issues offer them broadly for premium listeners in the way that they are doing now. And that made it so that they were like almost not at all a factor in Spotify's revenue business because Mm -hmm. no one is going to Spotify to purchase, you know, individual things like it's iTunes back in the day. So the fact that now it like really is integrated into the full, you know, subscription, I think will make a big difference for Spotify. Two questions that have come up in doing some reading for this episode. One is, so listenership, listening to an audiobook back in basically from 2011, 2012, 2013, 14, 15, 16, listening to an audiobook about 12 to 14% of people were listening to an audiobook five, six, seven years ago. Since then, it's gone from that 14% up to 23 and, you know, you could argue that was in tw- as of 2021, at least. So 23% of Americans listen to an audiobook as of 2021. That's behind read an ebook, 30%, read a print book at 65%. And so one of the questions is, why aren't more and more people reading them? One argument could be that friction is the main problem. As Spotify CEO Daniel Ek was saying, similar to music, one of the biggest problems here is friction. If you lower the friction, maybe you can help folks discover new audiobooks easily. So that's one of the questions. The other one is a kind of philosophical question, which was brought up in this New York Times article, which is, is this banned for book publishing? And they cited Kim Scott, best-selling author and former Google and Apple executive, saying uh, that they were worried Spotify's pay-as-you-listen model could devalue the work that goes into writing a book, saying it's reminiscent of how Apple changed the music sales business model, so from buying you know the whole CD uh, to buying individual songs. CDs have made six times more money than streaming, digital streaming. However, it has had a 20-year head start, admittedly, so maybe it, streaming will end up making more money for the music business than CDs did. But there is this question of, you know, is this a bad thing for publishing? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. Spotify certainly is notorious for not paying musicians very right. much, right? It's like one of the right. biggest criticisms of the company. So I think it's totally fair that, you know, the publishing industry would have similar concerns. Yeah. I mean, r- keeping up with books, like new book releases, or just going and buying a book, even if it was released 500 years ago, it's an expensive hobby, you know, like a, what are books cost like 15 to 20 something dollars on average least, new from yeah. a store. Yeah. Everyone should get a library card, by the way. That's the truth. But, and so, you know, this, like, I don't paying, have one, but I should get one. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I'm like, I'm being a hypocrite because I have one waiting for me at my local library branch, but I haven't gone to like go get it yet. Just, uh, <laughs> that counts. You know, it. it's, we'll a, it's a mile walk. It's a mile. Who's got <laughs> so yeah, Christy Fletcher, co-head of publishing division uh, for United Talent Agency was agreeing, saying while we all want to reach as many listeners as possible, there is a real risk that this consumption model devalues authors work and becomes the norm for all platforms. Miss Scott saying this isn't a launch and iterate moment for publishers. It's a Pandora's box. So we'll see. One other thing I thought was really interesting, Danny, you pointing out this out in one of your articles, I believe, noting that teens don't listen to audiobooks, but kids do. 
And so you've got a very big audience of kids there. 33% mm-hmm. of time with audio listening is with audiobooks, according to Edison Research. So there's a market of young folks. And also you're pointing out Bloomberg saying last summer, Spotify thinking about an additional premium tier with expanded audiobook access and higher quality audio streaming as well. So maybe some more money to be made there as well. Let's talk about how Spotify's main business has been doing from a user's perspective. Spotify now has 574 million monthly active users, adding 23 million in Q3. Spotify added the same number of users this Q3 as it did last Q3, 23 million. Danny, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I would say it's mixed. You know, part of Spotify's effort this quarter was penetrating foreign markets. They really made a big push into a lot of foreign markets, which led to, you know, good growth, but lower revenues because they had to offer a lot of discounts to onboard people the same way that they did when they first, you know, debuted in the US or wherever else and their their key markets. So it shows that there's some success there. Like they're making inroads in, you know, not the US and, and the UK where growth has kind of started to plateau a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I think it the fact that the number kind of didn't move over the course of a year Also shows that maybe the price increase that they implemented in this last quarter, you know, had a a dampening effect on new Spotify subscriptions. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's sort of a double edged sword. Yeah. Moving into those new markets that brought average revenue per user uh, down 6%. But to your point, they're able to to continue to increase users despite that price increase. Yeah. Monthly active users growing 26%. That's the second largest Q3 gain in company history. Spotify now double the number of users that they had just three years ago, which is just remarkable. How does Spotify stack up against the competition in the US? That's a good good benchmark. Spotify has 100 million US monthly listeners. That's listeners, not subscribers or anything. That's listeners, according to our forecasting team. That's more than double Amazon Music listeners and more than double Apple Music listeners. And over the next two years, we're expecting most of the growth to come from Spotify, even though they're in the lead by a lot. I'm expecting Spotify to add 10 million new monthly active users, which is five times more than Apple and Amazon will add. And also an incredibly engaging app. Danny, I don't know if this was at the bottom of one of your articles, but there was um, a chart showing basically the most engaging apps around in terms of time spent with them. And mm-hmm. only Netflix, TikTok, and Hulu command more minutes spent with them per day with users, according to us, as a few minutes ahead. Sorry, it puts it in fourth place and puts it a few minutes ahead of YouTube, which is in yeah. fifth. Which is remarkable. Yeah, that is remarkable because YouTube usually comes out ahead of all the other video services in terms of you yep. know, viewers and, and time spent. Yep. Netflix is at the top of this chart, but Spotify is pretty close behind. I mean, it's it's an hour for Netflix, 54 for TikTok, 53 for Hulu, and then Spotify at 51. Right. So, you know, they're up there. Let's move quickly to revenue. So Spotify made $3.6 billion in revenue in Q3. That's good enough for 11% growth year on year. Most of that money, 88%, comes from paying subscribers. The rest comes from ad-supported folks. What does this 11% revenue growth say about the company? I think it shows that there's some strong advertising growth. You know, they showed that ad-supported revenues were up 16% and music revenues were, you know, performing above average. I think they grew 20% and they didn't give a number for podcast ad revenues, but they said that it's in the quote, healthy double digit range. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, advertising continues to be like a really steady source of growth for Spotify, even if, you know, users in their key markets are maybe slowing down a little bit. So yeah, I think the 11% figure is, is strong and yeah. There's a lot of demand for advertising on music and podcasts, it's something that Spotify is really putting a lot of emphasis on, particularly with podcasts. Mm-hmm. Net income of 69 million. That's the highest net income since Q2 of 2022. So highest net income in the past year. Why? Uh, we mentioned that price increase. So in July, it went from 10 to 11 bucks and user growth not impacted. Dan Gallagher of the Wall Street Journal noting the timing made Spotify look almost charitable given its peers, Apple and Amazon had raised prices on their music streaming offerings months earlier and plenty of other streaming services, video streaming services, people have had to pay extra for. And so and they were the last one, one of the last ones to do so. And so maybe consumers looked more favorably on them as a result. They lowered employee costs as well. 600 folks yeah. uh, were laid off at the start of the year, 200 in the summer. So there's less money to spend there and they spent less on marketing as well. So that helped that net income figure. Daniel, let's round out the lead by talking about, you mentioned one thing you're paying close attention to is Joe Rogan and his contract with Spotify. Um, how come? 
Well, uh, Spotify paid a, a lot of money to acquire exclusive rights to Joe Rogan's podcast to be the hosting platform for it about three years ago. The contract is now running out, basically, and there is a question about whether or not Joe Rogan will renew because his audience has really only grown despite all these controversies. He really didn't see a decrease in listenership. And he is, by a lot of metrics, the most popular podcaster in the world, really. And the question is, does he really need Spotify? Maybe not. There are a lot of independent podcasts out there that don't have an exclusivity contract that seem to do pretty well. A lot of Spotify's bets on exclusive podcasts, like with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, did not really go anywhere, didn't really lead to anything. There's a good story in The Verge about this as well. So if Joe Rogan were to leave, that would presumably have a big effect on Spotify's podcast business because there's been a halo effect from uh, Joe right. Rogan listenership because the podcast that, you know, I mentioned the Harry and Megan podcast, but also like podcast companies that they have acquired have fizzled out. Like Gimlet, they acquired a couple of years ago. Gimlet has basically shrunk dramatically. Exclusivity caused listenership of Gimlet shows to plummet and they've laid off most of Gimlet's staff. Mm -hmm. So their outlook without like the big killer app is tough they're they're gonna have to make big changes if they lose him yeah we shall see that's all we've got time for for the lead skip the halftime report straight to the second half of the show today in other news how badly can ai hurt your company's customer service and google calling for a ban to personalize ads for minors story one how badly can ai hurt your company's customer service Srini Pajadayala, co-founder of enterprise chatbot iGo, points out a few ways it could in a recent Inc. article. One, an AI customer service chatbot could misinterpret a term that leads to bad advice. Two, it may struggle to understand context, forcing customers to frustratingly repeat themselves. Three, they're impersonal and lack sensitivity. And four, they could erode a brand's voice and identity. But Danny, to you, what is the number one pitfall when it comes to AI customer service chatbots? I think it's that they can just increase frustration. You know, when when you call customer service or speaking with customer service, the last thing you want is a more frustrating experience. Chances are you're already frustrated when you get there. And there's a lot of research that shows that AI chatbots are really inconsistent when dealing with common sense issues. In this Inc. story, there was a, a report from ResearchGate cited that showed that accuracy for sort of w what's classified as common sense queries fluctuates from 40 to 75 percent. So yes. that could result in things like inconsistent answers for the same problem for different consumers and uh, it could leave people more astray. You know, I think the idea for chatbots is efficiency. We don't have to devote human resources to solving these mundane problems, but even those mundane problems have a little bit of nuance and AI is just not very good yeah. at, you know, parsing through that nuance and it could just make consumers even more upset. Yeah, folks don't love them. Only 8% yeah. of customers used a chatbot during the most recent customer service experience, according to Gartner. Of those, of those 8%, just a quarter said they'd use that chatbot again, according to Ipsos. Close to seven out of 10 folks have utilized an AI customer service chatbot. But of those folks, eight out of 10 even more prefer interacting with a human for customer service needs. However, according to user-like research, folks are more comfortable receiving help from a chatbot as a first port of call, in large part because they like how quickly they respond. Yeah. Story two. Danny, you recently wrote that Google has called for a ban to personalize ads for minors with some caveats, releasing a proposed framework for a federal bill aimed at protecting underage users' private information. Google said the law should, quote, permit contextual ads based only on contextual signals, such as the current content being watched, search query, general location and time of day rather than a user's past viewing or search history or demographic data, close quote. But Danny, why is Google calling for this ban to personalize ads to minors? So there are two things kind of going on at Google that would lead them to do this. Over the summer, they had a couple of ad placement, you know, scandals at Google over the summer. One of them had to do with misplaced video ads that ended up with some refunds to advertisers. The other was that there were trackers on children's videos that basically made it so that if a child watching a video clicked on an ad or something, they would be given these common trackers that would then track them across the internet. Something that Google says that, you know, it does not support and doesn't want to do. So they got in some trouble for that. So this is a message to advertisers like, we are not 
in favor of this, even though we may have accidentally, question mark, done it ourselves. The other reason is that because federal legislation has moved so slowly for tech and privacy and advertising, states have had to pass their own individual bills and a lot of those bills are conflicting and it makes it really hard for a big company like Google to operate in each individual state. So in the last couple of months, we've seen big advertising groups say that they're going to push regulators for a federal privacy bill to overwrite the state ones to make it easier to operate. And even though Google didn't explicitly mention that call, this is a similar move. Yeah, you had a fantastic chart in your article. As of this summer, 10 states have passed privacy laws, six more considering. And as you mentioned, the details of each law vary considerably. Uh, that's all yeah. we've got time for for today's show. Danny, thank you so much for hanging out, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me. Always fun. Yes, sir. Thank you to Victoria, who edits the show. James, Stewart, and Sophie, as always, thank you to you. Thanks to everyone for listening into the Behind the Numbers Daily and the eMarketer podcast. You can tune in tomorrow to listen to the Reimagining Retail Show, where our host Sarah speaks with Ariel and Jeremy about where impulse buying fits online.